my name is Gregory Westwater and I'm joined here by Bill Oberkamp. Uh, Bill and I are both members of the uh, NAFIM's Simulation Governance and Management Working Group. And uh, we're gonna be talking today about the difference between model calibration and model validation. So Bill, to, to start right out, uh, the, the fact that we're trying to make a distinction you know, implies that these are separate activities or separate purposes. Um, how do you define each and, and what's the distinction there that, that you'd like people to understand? Okay, thanks, Greg. Uh, let's talk about the definition of model validation first. And we've talked a little bit about that in some of the earlier videos that we put together for NAFMS. Model validation is a model accuracy assessment relative to experimental data. In one sentence, that's what it is. So you've got to have experimental data. It's not a code to code comparison. And the simulation that you're assessing its accuracy is relative to the experiment that you're doing. It, whatever its relationship is to the real system, it can be a component, subassembly, whatever. And so it's an accuracy assessment. Whereas calibration, sometimes it's called model calibration or model updating. Uh, sometimes it's called uh, uh, model improvement. That is really uh, a model improvement activity. It is adding information, usually it comes from experimental data, to the model to improve its accuracy, you could say predictive capability. So those are the, the two basic concepts, Greg. Okay. And so I, I know a question that I kind of hear sometimes at conferences is, is model calibration appropriate or are there times that it's not appropriate? What, what are your thoughts there? Mm -hmm. uh, model calibration is almost always appropriate, especially in solid mechanics or structural dynamics. It's, it's, a, it's been done that way for forever. In fluid mechanics and some other fields, it's not done as much. But let's talk about some examples where it is absolutely needed and uh, critical to developing models because model calibration or model updating, uh, sometimes called parameter estimation, uh, they are most uh, commonly done in structural dynamics, sometimes in solid mechanics, but particularly in structural dynamics. And the reason is because in, let's take structural dynamics, vibration of a structure, you have a situation where you have submodels of, let's say, assemblies of structures like bolted joints or riveted joints and glue joints and things like that. Well, the physics in those connections are extremely complicated. In fact, we can't even really write down very good equations for them. So we have models there, you could call them submodels that represent the deformation and also the uh, damping, stiffness and damping of these joints. And this can be you know, a, a, a matrix, a, a, a tensor. And so what you do in that situation is you uh, take, say the structure of interest, it can be a substructure or whatever, and then you vibrate it, you excite it. So you get all the different modes in the structure and you take a lot of experimental data on the vibrating modes of the structure. Then you take that data, you do the inverse solution to the model because the reason it has to be an inverse is because you don't know those parameters. So you do the inverse solution in order to best estimate what those parameters, these are unknown parameters, specifically stiffness and damping, and these can be tensors. And so then you optimize, it's another way to say it, or you calibrate those parameters. And the, the final point is these parameters can be scalar values for each element of the tensor, or they can be probability distributions. That is, they're non-deterministic. So either way, that is the calibration step that is needed. In fluid mechanics, you don't do that very often. Sometimes you do, but structural dynamics is by far the most common. Yeah, and that's definitely where I saw my first example of it, where um, simulation user discovered that they could tune and get the answer they wanted by by changing some of the numerical settings, mm -hmm. and uh, and so uh, we dove into it to really understand and do our homework to to know what was going on and 
what it was we were representing or how we were influencing that. So exactly. that, that was an early learning opportunity for me there. Um, so what are some of the pitfalls of, of model calibration? Um, you know, I, I think probably the most common presumption is that kind of lulls us into this uh, false sense of security. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's a critically important uh, question because as you said, in, when you learned about this, these are, you could say it's model tuning. It's exactly what it is. But there are some recommendations or you could say rules on, what, on how you can do this. So the parameters that are fully defensible to tune or update, uh, calibrate, are the parameters in the model, or you could typically say the submodel, that you cannot measure independent of the system you're interested in. For example, if you have a bolted joint, if you take that bolt out and you take it apart, all of that physics is gone from the system. It only exists when the system is together. And so the complexity of that submodel uh, exists. And so you cannot measure those parameters directly. Like Young's modulus, you can measure independent of the structure. It's a characteristic of the material. But complex physics pieces, you have to calibrate those. So those are very defensible. That's the only way to do it. Now, there are some things that you should not calibrate or update. For example, Young's modulus, if you have it for all the different elements in the structure, it is inappropriate to readjust or retune that Young's modulus because you say, I can, I can measure that one very accurately on all the different pieces. So that's an example where it's fully defensible and needed and one where it's not defensible. Okay, thank you, I appreciate that. So um, I get the sense that, that model calibration is a step that precedes model validation. Um, is that a, a correct understanding? Uh, absolutely. Uh, and let's take the case of structural dynamics at calibration and validation. That, that sequence has been done many, many years, decades, okay? So what you typically do is let's suppose you have a built up structure, because that's always the best example. And it can be the complete structure or it can be a subassembly. makes no difference. So let's suppose you have a subassembly, and let's suppose you can test it in the lab. It doesn't have to be. It could be, let's say, a rocket launcher, and, but those are more difficult. But let's suppose it's an assembly or subassembly. You excite it and you calibrate the in, needed input parameters that you cannot measure using that data. So that's the calibration step. And then you can then go on to do model validation. And as I mentioned at the beginning, model validation is an accuracy assessment of the model. So sometimes people say, and maybe you've seen this, Greg, where you say, all right, I want to use the same data and compare with what I use for calibrate. And I said, no, 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 you're, you're, you're fooling yourself. Don't do that. Uh, you can do it, but what you'll find is, oh, the model looks great but that's not, the model is not that good, okay? Yeah, you so need to the, the perturb the system issue, a little bit and see how it changes. That's right, and people fool themselves, but if you think about it, you say, no, that, that's really not, that's a, it's a circular argument. So what you should do in the validation stage is to find some experimental data that has not been used for calibration. It can be a different, for example, a different loading on the structure or a different temperature of the structure, uh, whatever it is, but the model has never been tuned with that data, but you use the existing parameters you calibrated and then compare with this new data to see how well the model compares, the simulation compares with this new experimental data. So that's the brief, brief explanation. Okay. And I think uh, another personal experience there that I'd like to share that, that relates to that idea of uh, probably more to the model calibration side is I remember early on in my career, um, I was asked to do a thermal analysis and we had a kind of an extended structure that, that was hot at one end and there was a sensitive device at the other end and we wanted to make sure we weren't going to overheat that device. And, uh, and so we had some test data that we were working with and, and I discovered very quickly that you know, there was a lot of uncertainty around the convection coefficients and emissivity for radiation, as well as you know, what kind of contact losses were we getting between parts. And so with, you know, 
three variables or more to play with, it was really easy to get an exact answer at that location of interest. And uh, what saved me or, or kept me from blundering into making a novice mistake was the fact that we'd had the foresight to have an array of thermocouples along this whole structure. Mm -hmm. and, and I very quickly realized I needed not to tune to that one location of interest, but if I had the physics right, that would be, you know, give me the best answer or the best fit for the entire structure. Mm -hmm. And uh, so ever since then, that, that was a real wake up call to me. And I've, uh, you know, when I'm working with people who are calibrating a model, I've, you know, encouraged them to think about it in that way of getting response data throughout the structure, not just at the one point of interest. Yeah, that, that's a really good example. And he transferred, he transfers another field where you can't do it without calibration because emissivity is one that, okay, that's a complicated parameter, okay? And then also contact resistance, that, that's another really complicated one. And, and there's some others. And so those typically have to be calibrated first. And then the other point that you made is when you take a set of data, the broader the set of data, like you said, you had thermocouples over the structure, and then you can tune the parameters. You can tune them, that's fine. Okay, this is in the calibration step. You try to tune it where you have a set of, let's say, thermocouple data over the entire structure. Because if you just do it one point, you could tune it where you're gonna match it exactly. But you're fooling yourself if you think your model is that good. Because yep. every model and sub-model has approximations and assumptions built into it. So take as much data as you can. Yep. Yeah, it'd be real easy to look good uh, on day one, but not so good when the field failures start showing up months later. So. Or when your boss says, this system came apart. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, Bill. I appreciate your time today. And uh, next time we get together, uh, we're going to talk more about model validation again and, and comparing it to, to model prediction or the model predictive capability. So thank okay. you. Thank you, Greg.